Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of year. It's so beautiful out, Lord. And Lord, we just pray this morning as we gather together as believers to worship you, to study your word, that you'd open up to our hearts and our lives. There is such confusion in the world today, or in the church, I should say, today about uh, the rapture and what that's all about. And Lord, we just want to understand it. We don't want to be confused and we don't want to be discouraged. Our hope is in your return, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, this morning as we worship you, we just pray that it comes from our heart. Again, we love you so much, Lord, and we want to honor you. We want to worship you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Would you please open your Bibles this morning to Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, will it thus praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing, praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This morning, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm sure right now that your Bibles pretty much just open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But there is a lot of information here. And we've just been going through the Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica over the last few months here. And we've been in a section here in chapter 4 dealing with walking in hope. And again, I've said this before, you know, we need hope in this world. Without hope, we have nothing. We're just depressed. We're discouraged. But hope, man, isn't it exciting to have hope? You know, and Paul, his hope and our hope is based on the return of Jesus Christ. There's comfort in his return, and yet how many people today, Christians, have negated the return of Jesus Christ and specifically the rapture of the church? And when you do that, you end up taking that hope away. I'm not saying, hey, you know, I hope he comes back tomorrow because, you know, I, I have a lot of debt and this problem and that problem. No, I hope he comes back because I want to see this world changed. I look at what's going on in this world. You know, you see kids that are sick and dying with cancer, and, and your heart just breaks. Lord, I can't wait for the day when this won't be a problem anymore. I'm not looking for easy escapism. I realize there's tri tribulation in this world. But boy, when the Lord comes back and he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, righteousness will fill this land. Can you imagine how boring the news will be when he rules and reigns? It'll be so awesome. And I don't know about you, but boy, there is just tremendous comfort to me in his return. Tremendous. You know, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, 
that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. In other words, Paul was expecting the Lord to return for his bride, the church, when? During his day. He didn't say, they which are alive and remain, or you who which are alive and remain. He said, we who are alive and remain. Paul thought the rapture of the church, the Lord coming back, was going to happen in his day. It could happen at any moment. You think, well, it hasn't, and now here we are, 2,000 years down the road, and people are still talking about it. You know, let's just forget about it, and let's live our lives. Are you kidding me? We are 2,000 years closer. That, to me, it's, there is great excitement. In 1948, when Israel became a nation again, wow, just what the Bible said would happen, happened. A, a, a group of people that were almost exterminated are back in the land. Just as God said. Well, why didn't the Lord come? Why is he, in a sense, delaying? And I don't think it's a delay. I think it's perfect timing. But Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is giving people a chance to come to saving faith before he comes for his bride, the church. And you know what? When that last person comes to know Jesus, the Lord will return. And I'm not saying that every single person on earth is going to get saved. But there is a last person during this age of grace that once he gets saved, the rapture is going to occur. The Lord will meet us in the air and the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. And that's what we've been looking at over the last few weeks here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And I, I think it's important we understand what we believe. There is so much confusing stuff out there. You know, it, the Internet is an awesome thing, but it's also a dangerous thing. And there is so much garbage out there, and it gets promoted, and people believe it. I think it's important to understand what the Scriptures say so we're not confused about the days that we're living in. And we're going to read through these verses again this morning, and we're going to look at this timing of the rapture of the church. And I'm not talking about date setting, not at all. But I'm talking about when is this going to occur? When will this event occur on God's prophetic timetable? And you think, well, is this even important to me? Well, it should be. Jesus held the Jewish people responsible for not knowing the day of his visitation when he came the first time. They should have known. We should know what season we're in. And it's not that we get lazy. Paul is going to end up dealing with that, especially in 2 Thessalonians. He's going to deal with a group of Christians that just got lazy. And I don't know if their mentality was, hey, the Lord's coming back, why work? I might as well just sit around and do nothing. He's coming back. And, Lord re and Paul rebukes them. We are to continue serving, working, laboring for the Lord until he comes. That's important. Perspective, the correct perspective. You know, we've been looking at some different views regarding the timing, and we saw how those views are not correct and why they're not correct. You know, we talked about Christian Reconstructionism or Kingdom Now theology, where they believe, hey, we are going to make this world a Christian world. We're going to get in politics Christian leaders, in businesses Christian leaders, Christian leaders all over the place, and then Christ will come back. Hey, we can't even get Christian leaders in churches today. Forget politics. That's crazy. The world is going to turn against the Lord even more. And don't we see that? I mean, we see this antagonism towards Christianity. Why we're surprised at that, I don't know, but we are. And the world will get wicked. Does that stop us? Do we cower in fear? No. We forge ahead. We know the work is going to be tough. We know the world's going to get wicked. But can God save wicked people? Well, go look in a mirror. He did. All of us were wicked people, and he saved us. So, yeah, it doesn't matter how bad it is out there, because you know what? In the darkness, doesn't the light shine even brighter? Absolutely. Some believe that the Lord will come back at the midpoint of the tribulation period, the three-and-a-half-year mark. But again, we talked about how it doesn't make sense. 
because God is not going to pour out his wrath upon his bride. And we talked about the wrath beginning at the first seal judgment. Some say the pre-wrath rapture of the church or just after the three and a half year mark, after God's wrath is poured out, they believe it doesn't happen until after, sometime after the seal judgments. And again, we saw God's wrath being poured out with the first seal being opened because Jesus opens the seal. The post-tribulation rapture that happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation period that, you know, we're caught up to be with the Lord and we come right back down with him. But again, what do you do with the wrath of God being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world? That, that makes no sense. The partial rapture view says only those that are sanctified, only those that are good enough. I got news for you. If that's what needs to be done, if we have to be good enough to be raptured, none of us are going. That's, that's no good news at all. But here's the thing. How are we saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's not by my good works. You know, it's not like the Lord's going to come back and say, you missed it by that much. No, he paid it in full. It's called grace. There's nothing I can do to earn it. It's a free gift that God has given to me. How awesome is that? And it's not our righteousness. Here's the thing. If you think it's based on good works, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. I'm not talking about the bad things that you guys do. I'm talking about the good things compared to a holy and righteous God is like filthy rags before him. So how is that going to get you into heaven? How is the ra that going to get you in the rapture? It's not. The Bible says God took our sins and he gave us his righteousness that when the Father looks upon us, do you realize God looks upon us now and sees us as perfect? How many of you feel perfect? None of us do. But he sees us covered in the blood of Christ. All our sins have been taken away. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. I think the rapture of the church happens before the tribulation period starts. The pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And I just want to read through these verses, verses 13 through 18 here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we look at this concept of walking in hope. Listen to what Paul says. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. First of all, when Paul speaks of being caught up with those who are asleep, those who have died prior to the rapture, who's being caught up with these dead saints? Well, those of us who are alive and remain. Though, if we're living during the time of the rapture, we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord. What a wonderful thing. And when it says together with them, the Greek word for together is a word that deals with time. The Greek word for with is sun, and it speaks of space. And what Paul is saying is that we will arrive together at the same time and be together in the same space with the Lord when the rapture happens. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain are caught up together and we meet the Lord in the air at the same time. Why do they need a head start? Well, again, kind of tongue in cheek, but they're six feet lower than us, so they need that extra. I don't know. That's just, we meet the Lord together in the air. That's just the way it is. And we're going to be caught up, harpazo in the Greek. 
It speaks of snatching away. It happens very quickly, immediately. We are transformed when the rapture takes place in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I used this example before, but it kind of gives you a good picture of how fast this happens. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second, and it would take 1.5 seconds for light to travel from the Earth to reach the moon. That's, I mean, think about that, 1.5 seconds. And the moon is 239,000 miles from the Earth. So in the twinkling of an eye, the light would only reach one foot from the surface of the Earth. No one's going to see it happen. What they will see is the effects of all these people being caught up. They're gone. And we'll meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord. Wow, oh, I love that. We will always be with him. The one who loved us so much and we love, we're going to be with. And thus, in verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, here's the thing. And people who don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church kind of use this against us. But they say, look, you're just preparing your people to meet the Antichrist. They're not going to be ready for tribulation. What are you talking about? Isn't there tribulation from this world today? Absolutely. In other parts of the world, people are being, Christians are being put to death for their faith in Christ. There is tribulation in this world. Jesus never said there would be no tribulation. But where is this tribulation during the tribulation period coming from? The Lord. It's his wrath being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. And we see it from the first seal through the all the seven trumpet judgments, the seven bowl judgments. And here's the thing. Why would Christ pour out his wrath on his bride, the church? In fact, it makes no sense because didn't Jesus pay in full the penalty for our sins? Didn't he take the wrath that was due us? So why would God pour out his wrath upon us when it was already paid for? Again, we've got to think about this. And doesn't the Bible call us ambassadors for Christ? We're his representatives here on earth. I like that. Did you know before World War II started that Japan and Germany called their ambassadors home? They left America and went to their own home countries? They think, well, why? Because war was, was going to break out and they wanted their people back home before it happened. Well, doesn't God want us home before he pours out his wrath? He's going to call his ambassadors home. And this isn't our home. We're aliens and strangers. We're pilgrims on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. And I think many have lost sight of that. I'm not saying you can't enjoy yourself in this world. I'm not saying you can't live in this world. We do live in this world. I mean, we, my, my wife and I and, and our kids, we got together yesterday and went to this uh, uh, farm down in Madison area and you know, went through a corn maze. Thank God I had my son with me. He got me out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. I'd still be in that maze. Uh, but it was wonderful. We had a wonderful day. The Bible doesn't say you can't enjoy yourself. You can. But this isn't our home. Our, home, our citizenship is in heaven with the Lord. Isn't it what Paul said to Titus in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing. We know he's coming back. That we'll be with him. And we should comfort each other with these words. That's what Paul did to these Thessalonian believers. So what is this whole idea about the pre-tribulation rapture of the church? Why do we think that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation period starts. Well, I'm going to give you a couple points why I think this, what the scriptures say. You know, you can pray about it, decide for yourself, but I think it's pretty clear because we looked at the other views, and the other views all have us being taken up during the tribulation period sometime. But as I said, God's wrath is poured out at that first seal because that first seal is opened by Jesus Christ, and he unveils the Antichrist. And that is God's judgment upon a Christ-rejecting world, that man of sin, the man of lawlessness. 
Tim LaHaye wrote, When I was a boy, I took a tour of the Henry Ford factory in Dearborn, Michigan. Then we saw an electromagnetic crane move over, move over a large railroad car filled with what seemed to be junk steel. At the flip of a switch, everything in the car leaped up to the magnetic crane. Then I saw a strange thing. Some pieces of steel fell back into the car. I waited until others had left on the tour and then climbed up to look inside and find out why these pieces fell back in. I found they were not steel at all. Lying on the bottom of the car were some old two-by-fours, a broom handle, and some broken pieces of wood. Only objects made of the right component responded to the magnet. The rest were left behind. That is so true with our Lord, right? When he takes his bride home to be with him, those that aren't his aren't going to go. It should just make sense. There are many who may go to church, look like the bride, but they haven't been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They're not wearing the right apparel, you might say. And that apparel is given to us. It's a grace gift. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. It's freely given to us. And his righteousness, wow, imputed into our lives by faith. Now, I didn't think I would see this. I, I, I guess I didn't see it coming. But there is really a hostile attack right now on those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. If you have opposing views, that's fine. I, I mean, I don't care. You know, when we're caught up, it's not going to even matter because we're going to be with the Lord. There's not going to even be a discussion about it. I'm just giving you what I feel the scriptures are saying. If you differ from me, that's fine. This isn't a salvation issue. But right now, there are many that are hostile if you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And I think it's important for us to know what we believe, why we believe it. I don't want you saying, well, Pastor Joe said so, because that's not going to get you anything. I want you to say, well, this is what the scriptures say. That's the most important thing. And so we need to understand, we need to know what we believe, because there is an attack against what we believe. Thomas Ice, who is a great prophecy teacher, he wrote this. Critics of pre-tribulationism -tribula sometimes state that belief in the rapture is a doctrinal development of recent origin. They argue that the doctrine of the rapture or any semblance of it was completely unknown before the early 1800s and the writings of John Nelson Darby. One of the most vocal and sensational critics of the rapture is Dave McPherson, who argues that during the first 18 centuries of the Christian era, believers were never rapture separators. They never separated the minor rapture aspect of the second coming of Christ from the second coming itself. Well, we talked about the huge difference between the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church, where the Lord meets us in the air, the second coming he comes to the earth with his saints. Rapture of the church, we're caught up. Second coming, every eye will see him. There's huge differences in the two. A second critic, John Bray, also vehemently opposes a pre-tribulation rapture writing. He said, this teaching is not a recovery of truth once taught and then neglected. No, it, is, it never was taught. For 1,800 years, nearly no one knew anything about such a scheme. Again, I find that interesting. 1,800 years, no one heard of the rapture before. We'll talk about that. More recently, pre-trib opponent Robert Van Camperen proclaimed the pre-tribulational rapture position with its dual perusas was unheard of in the church prior to 1830. Christian reconstructionists have also consistently and almost universally condemned premillennialism and pre-tribulationism, favoring instead postmillennialism. One sample of their prolific and often uh, opposition can be seen in Gary North's des derisive description of the rapture as the church's hoped for escape hatch on the world's sinking ship, which he, like McPherson, believes was invented in 1830. So there is a lot of stuff out there slamming what we believe. And I'm not sure why they say that it wasn't taught for 1800 years. We went over this already. You know who taught it? Paul the Apostle did. <laughs> you know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus spoke of it in John chapter 14. And what we just read this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul thought it was going to happen in his day. But again, many think this is ridiculous to believe in this rapture. 
It's not scriptural. One writer said, Rapture doctrine is one of the most recent new doctrines in the history of the church. The only doctrine more recent is the invention of the sinner's prayer for salvation by Billy Sunday in 1930, which was made popular by Billy Graham in 1935. The fact that John Nelson Darby invented the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine around 1830 A.D. is unquestionably true. So you can't question it. It's unquestionably true. It was invented by John Darby around 1830, right? All attempts to find evidence of this wild doctrine before 1830 have failed. With a single exception, Morgan Edwards wrote a short essay as a college paper for Bristol Baptist College in Bristol, England in 1744, where he confused the second coming with the first resurrection of Revelation 20 and described the pre-tribulation rapture. However, Edwards' ideas, which he admitted were brand new and never before taught, had no influence in the modern population of the false doctrine. That prize goes to Darby. Prior to 1830, no church taught it in their creed, catechism, or statement of faith. Darby has had a profound impact on the religion today since Darby's secret rapture false doctrine has infected most conservative evangelical churches. While the official creeds and statements of faith of many churches either reject or are silent about rapture, neither, neither do they openly condemn this doctrine of a demon from the pulpit. So if you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, you believe, are, it's a de demonic doctrine. It's a doctrine of demons. He says, when not all dispensationals believe in the rapture, all those who teach the rapture also believe in premillennialism. Both groups use Israel's modern statehood status of 1948 to be a beginning of a countdown to the end. Here's the thing, and I've said this before. If you have a misconception about Israel, the Jewish people, your end times theology is going to go astray. You are going to be screwed up. That's just the way it is. God is not done with the Jewish people. There is still one more seven-year period of time, according to the 70 weeks of Daniel, that God is going to deal with the nation of Israel. And guess what? He's going to bring an end to their sin. He's going to bring them back into the kingdom. Why? Because they're going to come to Jesus. He's not done with them. David McPherson said since the early 1970s, Dave Mc, or we're told Dave McPherson since has aggressively attacked the pre-tribulation rapture by attributing its origin to Margaret MacDonald, who McPherson considers to be a cult influence. He claims Darby derived the pre-tribulation rapture from her. It was done secretly. Give me a break. You know? You know, it, we are living in a day where we have access to so much information. But we need to check it out. Here's one thing you can hold on to regarding the Bible. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. Do you think all of a sudden God's going to say, you know what, for 2,000 years I haven't told them about this, but now I am? His word is completed to us. Yes, there were mysteries that Paul, that God revealed to Paul about the church and the rapture and so on. But the book is done. It's written. And if there's something new out there that has never been revealed before, I question that. To say that there is no historical church evidence about the rapture of the church is foolishness. Or, as a phrase that we like to use today, fake news. We have to search it out. One writer said, well, the text is attributed to Ephraim the Syrian, A.D. 373. His teaching was so popular in the early Byzantine church in Syria that numerous authors later wrote commentaries on his works and incorrectly attributed the later manuscripts to Ephraim the Syrian. These attributed works are designed as pseudo or false if scholars are not totally convinced the books were actually written by the attributed authors. Some scholars have suggested that this text should be called pseudo Ephraim 
while others conclude that Ephraim is the original author. Well, what, did, what was written? What did the early church have to say about this pre-tribulation rapture? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. There is this manuscript from 373 A.D., okay, not 1800s, 373 A.D., from Ephraim the Syrian, or a writing derived from his teaching called Pseudo-Ephraim, like I said, and it, thus it's dated anywhere from the time of Ephraim when he lived in 373 all the way to 627 A.D. And this is what it said. Listen carefully. You tell me what this teaching is on. All the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. What do you think that's talking about? The rapture of the church before the tribulation period starts. Not by John Nelson Darby. By Ephraim the Syrian. All believers are gathered together before the tribulation period begins. And we're going to be taken where? To the Lord. So to say that this teaching is from the 1800s is ridiculous. It's not true. Another one, the shepherd of Hermes in 140 AD. You have escaped from great tribulation on account of your faith and because you did not doubt in the presence of such a beast. Go therefore and tell the elect of the Lord his mighty deeds and say to them that this beast is a type of the great tribulation that is coming. If then ye prepare yourselves and repent with all your heart and turn to the Lord, it will be possible for you to escape if your heart be pure and spotless and you spend the rest of the days of your life in serving the Lord blamelessly. And again, the idea is they were going through some tough times. And the writer was talking about, hey, you know, this is a picture of what's coming, but you're going to escape from it. And the early church believed that the rapture of the church was imminent. It could happen at any time. But let me also say this. Just because the early church taught something is really meaningless. And I know that's shocking to some. But it really is meaningless because the church was screwed up by 100 A.D. And we'll talk about that in a minute then what makes this teaching right? Because it's what the scriptures teach. I don't bring things into the light of the early church and say, hey, if they did it, it's got to be right. I bring it in light of the scriptures and say it's right. And if the early church was doing it and it's in line with the scriptures, it even solidifies it. Like, Look, this is the practice that was going on. But the early church was screwed up. Turn over to Revelation chapter 4 for a minute. I want to show you why I believe the church is taken up before the tribulation period begins. Um, we have to remember that the church and Israel are two different entities. And the age of grace is coming to an end, and God will deal with the Jewish people again, and he will pour out his wrath in a Christ, on a Christ-rejecting world that is the tribulation period, those seven years that the scripture talks about. In Revelation chapter 4, look at verse 1. John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. John opens up, he says, after these things are metatata in the Greek. After what things? Well, after the things of the church. If you look at Revelations chapters 2 and 3, it speaks of the church age. Yes, these were specific churches that, were, that Jesus was writing to that had problems, but if you look at throughout the history, this speaks of the church age living into the last day's church of, you know, Laodicea, the lukewarm church, which I believe were there today. 
How do I know this is what's going on here? Well, because Jesus gives us an outline of the book of Revelation. This is the only book I know of where we have an outline. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus said this. He said, Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. There's the outline of the book of Revelation. The things that John has seen, those are the events found in Revelation chapter 1. They are the things that God has shown him so far. The things which are speak of the events which are taking place now during his time. The things of chapters 2 and 3 and also into the church age now. Because like I said, these are, this is a picture of the church age. We have to remember, these churches actually existed during John's day. But boy, when you look at what is said of these churches, and you look at church history, it all plays out. And lastly, the book is divided into this. The things which will take place after this. Metatata in the Greek, after this. After the age of grace. After the church age. That's the last division of the book. And you know, you could look at Revelation chapters 14 through, or 4 through 18. Deal with the events leading up to the second coming of Christ, including the seven-year tribulation. Chapter 19 deals with the second coming. Chapter 20, the aftermath and the setting up of the kingdom of God on this earth. Chapters 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the earth, the eternal state. But here in Revelation 4.1, as the church age comes to an end, John sees a door open in heaven. Then a voice like a trumpet is calling to him and showing him what will or must transpire after the church is removed from the earth. And the voice of a sound of a trumpet. It's the same voice spoken of in Revelation 1, verses 10 and 11. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, John says, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, the Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you think, well, who is that voice? Who's speaking? Well, if you continue on reading in Revelation 1, you see a description of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 18, this is something that only Jesus can do. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. That's got to be Jesus, right? Almighty God becoming flesh and blood, going to the cross of Calvary, dying for our sins, rising the third day. He who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. There it is. That's Jesus. And who's calling John to heaven? Jesus is. Who calls his bride? Jesus does. That's what we read here in 1 Thessalonians. The Lord himself in verses 16 and 17 is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall always be with him. I think Jesus gives us the call, both living and the dead, and we meet him in the air. And immediately we're with him. And that's what John says. Immediately I was in the Spirit. I'm immediately caught up into heaven. There it is. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, you know, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Because the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The twinkling of an eye were transformed. They have to be changed. These physical bodies of flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so we'll be changed. We'll get our new bodies. And we'll always be with the Lord. So we're going to get these eternal bodies at the rapture. And then the tribulation period starts. How soon after the rapture does the tribulation period start? I honestly can't tell you. It could be immediate. It could be a period of time. 
You have the rapture of the church before the tribulation period starts. There may be a period of time. Because I truly believe before the tribulation period starts, there's going to be utter chaos on this earth. You know, we see glimpses of that now. We see this, you know, nut job in North Korea, right? We see Iraq and what they're doing and what they're saying. We look at the cataclysmic events that are happening all over the world. The number of earthquakes and volcanic activity have increased tremendously. The earth's being shaken. And we look at Russia. And we see they have boots on the ground in the Middle East for the first time. And that's interesting because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, after chapter 37 of Ezekiel, where Israel is back in the land, those dry bones come to life, we see Russia with a hook in that bear's jaw being drawn into a battle. And I believe that battle is in the Middle East. And it, the world will be on the verge of extinction. A major battle is taking place between the Jews in Israel and Russia and all her Muslim allies. And understand there's over 100 million enemies that surround Israel today. Three sides, they're surrounded by enemies. The other side is the Mediterranean Sea. And they're going to come down against her. And God says, I'm going to smoke those people. I'm going to take care of them. Think, you know, how does a one world religion, how does Islamic fundamentalism fit into a one world religion? It doesn't. Islamic fundamentalism, those that are following the Quran, doesn't fit in with a one world religion. It can't, because you must die if you don't follow. But if those people are wiped out, you have your lukewarm, compromised Muslims as well as the rest of the religious world coming together. And I think that is the opening for the Antichrist to come onto the scene. I think the world is going to be looking for an answer. We need someone. We'll, we'll surrender to anyone. We'll give you our authority if you can rule this world and keep us safe. It's going to happen. Jesus told the religious leaders in Israel, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have life, but they are they that speak of me. I've come in my Father's name, you've rejected me. And here's the key. Another is coming in his own name, and him you will receive. What was he talking about? Who was he talking about? He was talking about the Antichrist. You see, the Jews are going to be duped for three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation period. Not every Jew. We know that there are the two witnesses that come forth. I, I believe it's Elijah and Moses. We could debate that forever, and we'll find out. But I think those are the two witnesses. And out of that, we have 144,000 Jewish witnesses, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel that get saved. Imagine 144,000 Paul the Apostles running around. Wow. Wow. Jews get saved. I believe Gentiles get saved as well during that period of time. But Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, prophet, you're to flee to the mountains. And that's at the three and a half year mark of the seven year tribulation period where the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple and demands to be worshipped as God. And Jesus says, when you see that, you flee. And I think that's when the eyes of the rest of the Jews are open and they go, oh my gosh, we were following a man. And they flee to Petra. And I think by the time the last three and a half years have ended, I think it's the Jews calling upon Jesus to return. Because Jesus said, you'll see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And one of the places that Jesus comes to when he returns, which is kind of bizarre if you think about it, is Basra. Petra. Why would he go there? Why not, you know, Jerusalem? Well, he will be there. But why Basra? Because that's where the Jews are hiding out. That's where God is protecting them for those three and a half years. That's what's coming. And it's after that seven-year tribulation period where the Lord will establish his kingdom and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. 
You know, in one of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the churches in Asia Minor, in Revelation 3.10 to the church in Philadelphia, the faithful church, Jesus says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. He said, I will keep you from. It means out of. There is a trial coming upon the earth, and who is this trial for? Earth dwellers, right? Those who are living upon this world, on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's not upon us. And it's a definite period of time, the hour of trial. And I think it's that seven-year tribulation period that Daniel speaks of, the 70th week of Daniel. But God's going to keep us out of this time. And make no mistake about it, guys, the only reason we are worthy to escape this judgment is because of what Christ has done. It's not because of what we have done. Our citizenship is in heaven. And think about it. In Genesis chapter 19, God is going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Righteous Lot and his family had to be removed, though, before that took place. The angel said to Lot, he said, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. I'm thankful for that. The prerequisite to the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah is a lot had to be removed. In 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And I think the prerequisite to the tribulation period is that the church must be removed before God can pour out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. God, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 5.9, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key. Not to his wrath. Yeah, we'll have tribulation in this world. Absolutely. But not the wrath of God being poured out upon us. And in, as you read the book of Revelation, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the church is mentioned 18 times. In the first three chapters. Which makes sense. You know, we're dealing with the church age, right? In chapters 2 and 3 especially. But we don't see the church again until we return with Christ in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 14. Chapters 4 through 18, the church, when it is even mentioned, is in heaven. And I believe the day of the Lord begins with the introduction of God's wrath being poured out, and it extends through the millennial kingdom. Not that there's wrath being poured out during the millennial kingdom. But as you go into Second Peter, he talks about the day of the Lord and the heavens and earth dissolving. What's he talking about? He's going to create a new heavens and earth. So that's got to be after the millennial reign when he's creating a new heavens and a new earth and establishing the eternal state. So this is the, we're living in the age of grace, guys. And I'll tell you what, it's so refreshing. It's not about what I have done. It's about what he has done. And when I get in the way, and I think it's about me and what I have done, do you realize that's pride? No, I'm basically saying to the Lord, hey, thanks a lot for what you did, but I got this. You don't got this. <laughs> I know my English teacher would be really upset with that phrase, but... You don't got this. Don't negate the grace of God. And please understand, saying that, talking about the grace of God doesn't give us a license to sin. Because if that's your heart attitude, you got a wrong heart. My wife and I, we have really a grace relationship. And I don't do things to hurt her most of the time. The flesh is always there. Because I love her. Our relationship is based in love. And that's our relationship with God, isn't it? Isn't it based in his love for us and we love him? 
Thus, we live for him. We serve him. We want to do things that would honor him and please him. Absolutely. Do we blow it? Yeah. And I'll tell you, God's word is so refreshing to me. And hopefully it is to you. You know, one day he's calling his bride home. You and me. David Breeze said this regarding the rapture and the second coming. He said, The rapture therefore comes before the tribulation and takes Christians out of this world before that seven year period of the wrath of God. Notice that in the rapture, Christ does not come all of the way to this world. Rather, Christians are caught up to meet him in the air. At the second coming of Christ, his glorious return, he comes with his saints. In fact, he returns with an army from heaven for the conquest of the world. Remember, in that, this is an army of his saints, and you will be part of that glorious conquest that centers on the return of Christ in power. And as we talked about before, in Matthew chapter 24, it talks about every eye will see him. Every eye. As lightning you know, flashes across the sky, they will see him coming. The rapture of the church is not like that. It's boom, we're with him. And people will see the after effects, but they won't see the Lord. Not till the second coming. I think, well, Sean, enough is enough with this whole rapture of the church thing. There are so many other things we can talk about, and that's true. But remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. He said, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. I want you to understand this. This is important. And understand, you know, the, the Thessalonian believers, Paul only spent maybe 21 days with them, teaching them. And they, all, they were talking about the rapture of the church. You think, oh my gosh. And yet people today just blow it off. They don't want to be bothered with it. I'm like, man, I'm excited about it. When I first got saved, some 30-some years ago, this was at the forefront. The return of Christ was everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. The Jews were back in the land. They saw what was going on in Russia, you know, all these things, and they were so excited. Now, 30-some years later, we've heard that before. What's the big deal? We need to live. We're missing it. We're missing it. And we've become ignorant about it. And we've lost hope about the future. Do you really want the future to be this world right now? I don't. And it's not just because of all the evil and stuff. It's because of even the sickness. I, I cannot watch, you know, children hospital commercials to see these kids who have cancer. I'm going, oh my God, they are so brave. I stubbed my toe and I'm crying, you know. And these kids have got cancer and they're going through chemo and uh, surgeries and all this stuff. And your heart just goes, Lord, please come back. This is not what you intended, uh, intended. This is the result of what sin has done in this world. We're seeing the effects. And I guarantee you, guys, if the Lord came back right this moment, we would rejoice because we wouldn't miss anything. We're with the Lord. If he doesn't come back for 20 years, rejoice because God has given us time to share the good news. We were talking about rejoicing all the time, yeah. And I, again, I say rejoice as Paul did in Philippians, right? Absolutely. And again, guys, don't look at church history to see what to practice today. Look at the Word of God. You know, the Ephesian church, the first letter that Jesus wrote about, they had a lot of good works. They were working hard, but they lost their first love. Jesus it was all about works. Got to do this. Got to do that. Work this. Work that. Uh, hello, boys. I'm over here. They lost their first love. You got to think about a marriage relationship. I can you know, cut the grass, do the dishes, do the wash, do this, do that, do the, all these things, right? What if I don't show any love towards her? Well, I'm working. What more do you want? Doesn't that do it? She doesn't want that. 
So several years ago, she said something really simple that, you know, it's kind of like those should have had a V8 type moments. She goes, but you didn't say you loved me. What do you mean? I, I show you all the time. I need to hear it. Well, yeah, doesn't the Lord want us to say we love him? Not just work, 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 work. What's the work for? Why are you doing it? Do you love him? Tell him. Talk to him. He wants that relationship. We're the bride of Christ. And then the church of Smyrna. Yeah, that was pretty good because they were the persecuted church and they were strong in the faith. Persecution kept them strong. And then the church of Pergamus, the compromising church, false doctrine, sexual immorality. Uh, church of Thyatira next is, again, a corrupt church. False doctrine, immor sexual immorality. Sardis, they started out well, be became dead. They were like a, it was like a monument. It's, it's cold, it's stone. It doesn't even move anymore. We, this is what we do. We do always do this. No. They became an organization instead of a living organism, just growing and moving. Philadelphia was the faithful church. And then the last, last day's church, which I think several of those are, but the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, not hot, not cold, just, hey, we're just doing our thing. We're just lukewarm. I, I don't, Jesus says, I'd rather you be cold. Why? Because if you're cold, you'll, know, you'll be missing something. You'll want that warmth. If you're hot, on fire, praise God, man, it's awesome. But lukewarm, I'm just comfortable. No problem. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, man, I'm, I'm knocking on the door of your church. Let me in. And really, I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Let me in. I want to come in. So church history is not that good, even from early on. Around 100 AD, it was problems. You look at the letters that Paul wrote, that Peter and, and the others wrote, and you look at how many are correctional. Most of them are. Because false doctrine comes into a church. And people don't like it when it's dealt with. I mean, the Corinthian church, they were pretty carnal. I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Jesus, man. I got Jesus all. No! You're, you're missing the whole point. They were very. They had spiritual gifts. They were abusing them. Man, let's look at what God's Word has to say. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Live it. Let you your life live what God has said. How important that is. And we have moved away from the literal interpretation of the scriptures. Yes, there are times that the scriptures are figurative in nature. Jesus says, I am the door. That's, that's a picture, right? But we've taken what is literal and watered it down and made it figurative in nature. Well, when Jesus says he's the only way, he's really saying that he's one of many ways. My grandson, how old is Liam? He's 11 years old. He went to Awanis. And the teacher said, now remember, wide is the gate that leads to life. And Liam says, no, I think narrow is the gate. No, 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 no. Wide is the gate. Isn't that interesting? So he went home and told his mom and dad. He said, you know, I don't think he's right. And they told him, you're right. Narrow is the gate because it's only through Christ. Here's an 11-year-old kid, and here's a leader that is leading people to the wide road. And I don't think that's accidental. It's very clear in the scriptures. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Do you see how we have to train up our children? We have to train up ourselves. Because it, they, be they knowing or unknowingly, are leading people astray. It is not a wide gate. In fact, it's the false prophets that are out there with the wide gate going, come on over here, over here, and they're waving people. 
but it's the narrower. It's only through Christ and no one else. I like what one guy said. He said, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Right? Why do we have to negate what God's Word has to say? Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about these things. Those who have fallen asleep, you know, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. We have hope. When we die, we go to be with the Lord. We get our new bodies just when the Lord comes back for his bride, the church. But we're with the Lord. It's not that we can't mourn over the loss of a loved one. Of course we do. But we have hope. Well, I'm going to see him again. And the Lord's coming back. And you could take it literally, or you can try and say, well, it means something else. It doesn't. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Simple as that. Remember the story I told you when we started out this morning about World War II when it started, that Japan and Germany called their ambassadors home. They left America. They went to their home countries. Why? Because war was out, about to break out. And their countries wanted them to be home before war was declared. And that's what the Lord is going to do. Before he declares war on earth, before he pours out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world, he's going to call his ambassadors home, you and me. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Comfort one another with these words. Encourage each other. The world's not out of control. God's in total control. Don't ever think that, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We're in trouble. God's in control. We know these are the last days. We know what they're going to be like. We know what's going to happen. We shouldn't be taken astray because God has warned us. And we should be excited that he's coming back for his bride, the church. And we need to look up because our redemption is drawing near. And, you know, it's not only comforting the brethren about this, but it's sharing with others. The Lord's coming back. Whether you agree with it or not, He is coming back. And thus, guess what happens, guys? When you have this as a truth and you understand this, you can walk in hope. And boy, what great comfort that brings to us, right? Let's walk in hope. Father, we thank you so much for this great hope, Lord. You're coming back for your bride, the church. What a joy that's going to be. But until then, Lord, help us to occupy or to continue doing the things you called us to do until you come. Never to lose sight of that. Never to get um, discouraged or downcast. But, Lord, to keep our eyes on you and know that, Lord, you're going to open doors of opportunity for us that we will never believe. It'll be beyond anything we could ask or think, exceedingly abundantly, Lord, beyond what we could ask or think. And we want to bring glory and honor to you. Help us to take those steps of faith, Lord. And, Lord, use us to the fullest until you call us home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.